Uh, so hey everybody, got a new uh, a new face here on uh, on Zoom tonight. This is Carolyn, my wife, and uh, she's here because most of the camping moto camping we've done has been uh, together and with our daughter Janine. Um, and we're going to show you some photos of some of the camping we've done. Um, and we won't bore you; it's not that many slides. Uh, but we want to really sort of give you an illustration of how we've done it. And I realized that. There are a lot of people when I was doing invitations for this that know more than uh, more than about camping than I do as far as all the things that are all the options that are available, particularly now. Um, what we have is a lot of years of uh, of camping, and so we over the time over that time have developed our own way of doing things, and that's what we want to share with you is how we've done it. But more so than that, because there's the nuts and bolts of what tents we've used and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, but really, we kind of want to talk about the benefits of it and, um, and some of the experiences that we've had and really encourage you to, to try this out, but to also you know, be realistic about the limitations and that kind of thing. So no further ado, let's just sort of chat about, um, you know, about why you would want to do it. One thing that when we're on trips oftentimes is I can kind of be a little cranky at times on long trips and, uh, and uh, I'll say, hey, let's just get a motel. And Carolyn's the one who says, no, no, no. And, and she has a good reason for that. Every time that, uh, that uh, I sort of suggest this because it's easy and I'm tired and all this, uh, she's the one who says, I want to camp. And why? Well, <laughs> that's what I say at the time, why? Why can't we take a motel? I really like the camping because I feel like I'm in the environment of where we are. Um, I get to know the location much better by being out in the woods, um, seeing the local people, whoever's camping, and just feel like I'm present. When yeah. we're in a motel, every motel kind of seems the same and you sit back and watch TV and you know, yeah, that's nothing what, like sitting around a fire. Yeah, and that's kind of what we do is when we're in a motel, we do easily slip back into, uh, you know, watching television and you know, and just sort of you know, uh, disengaging. But when we're camping, that's the last thing we do is disengage because there's always something that needs to be tended to, and it's just a very different pace. So, uh, so that's one big thing, and that's why over the years with our family trips, almost every one of them. Uh, when Janine was little and small, and even up until when she was uh, riding her own motorcycle, that the camping trips were really the things that that we would remember uh, way more than the you know the times when we you know hit motels for you know a few days or something on a trip. Um, so that's why we do it. Now, one thing that Carol and I were talking about with um, if any of you are just contemplating it or wondering about it or have this romantic vision of it that we want to kind of point out that it is, it's got an adventure to it that you can't really get otherwise. It adds a, uh, a facet, a perspective to your trip that you won't get if you're just you know, comfortable all the time. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Like that time that we pulled into Grand Canyon campground with the uh, dark clouds coming and, and, uh, Janine was with us and just barely set up the tent before it started to pour and yeah. dove into the tent, tossing our things in. Yeah. And, uh, you yeah. know, you always remember that. Yeah, so that was, that was a particularly interesting one. We were on our trip uh, that I actually posted some photos on Facebook uh, that was in 2004. Um, Janine was 14, so she was on the back with me. And we're going to show some photos really, you know, fairly soon so uh, to match so you can visualize some of this. And... Uh, uh, we were on our trip that we had trailered out to Denver and then we uh, camped and rode for like 2,000 miles in 10 days. Mm -hmm. That's something like what I remember. So it was a whirlwind. We hit all most of the uh, um, national parks. And this one here though with the Grand Canyon is lucky. Some, uh, somebody asked on Facebook whether we make reservations or not. And there was a time when we kind of, you know, would wing it a little bit, but really now we make reservations, particularly because the na national parks uh, and state parks even really fill up, uh, and even more so now. It seems like the COVID thing has really gotten people out into the campgrounds. 
so we do. We uh, we make reservations. Actually, now Carolyn made reservations for Yellowstone for next year uh, for our camper, which I'll show you a photo of or what our camping entails now. Um, yeah. So the adventure part, uh, like the the uh, um, Grand Canyon thing, was an excellent example. We've had a lot of them though, right? North Carolina, rain. You know, we've hit rain all the you know, and they're again they're memorable at the time. It sucks. <laughs> Let's face it. But it, but when you look back on it. You know, we know that that we endured and we had a good time and, you know, we were prepared enough that we weren't miserable. So when I say it sucks, it's like it just, you know, not as good as a, as a clear day. Um, but, you know, what some of the things are um, that I do want to share with you, like I said, is, is some of our experiences. And then we'll get into some nuts and bolts. But I want you to start thinking about your questions because I have notes and notes, just like usual, uh, three pages of it of nuts and bolts. So things like, you know, what we chose for a tent and why and air mattresses and all the nuts and bolts and even like some of the procedures. Um, but it'd be better in, in, in this topic here, this is normally my topics are skills oriented and I wanna make sure I hit all the highlights. This is really more about an interesting topic of uh, that can be a little more loose. And so I think it can be more question and answer driven. Um, so get your questions ready and you can start shooting them to John uh, in the Q&A, um, not the chat, the Q&A window. Let me just show you some, uh, uh, a few of the photos from some of our past um, adventures. Uh, let me see. All right. So unfortunately I can't get this to be full screen. So let's enjoy it as much as we can this way. So you can see here, that how we loaded up our bikes and we had sport bikes. This is Carolyn's YZF 600 from, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, you can see how we would load it up. She was kind of the mule and it kind of made the bike feel a little bit he heavy, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, the mate lightened up the front wheel. So when I wasn't used to it, I'd always have to take a few miles to get used to it. But yeah. um, then I forgot about it. Um, I tended to have the tent and you can see some um, rolled up air mattresses there and then um, full panniers, one with my clothes and the other one with um, uh, kitchen stuff for meals and um, things like that. Um, and then Janine rode with Ken and I don't know if you have a picture of that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I do. Oh, that's not, so this... <laughs> This is actually a, a photo, a little out of sequence. This is Janine, if you can see this. Uh, this is the top of her helmet there on the right that's leaning against my back. This is when she was, uh, we were first starting to do our family trips. When she was eight. Yeah, I guess she was about eight. She could reach the handlebars or the uh, foot pegs. And, uh, but we were always concerned, you know, kids that age fall asleep. So we, I made this, uh, this backrest here, if you can see that. It's a full backrest that was off of some 1970s, uh, you know, Honda, and I just fabricated it. And this, these black bars here, these tubes are is PVC pipe, and it sort of goes around so that, and it goes all the way up and basically touches my back, uh, so that she could fall asleep and she won't um, kind of fall between me and that, in that, uh, in that little seat. And we would let her just fall asleep, and she would quite often. So. When, when we started camping, we didn't have much money. We were both uh, freelance artists. And so that must have been our garbage bag era when we had um, garbage bags yeah. to, as rain covers. Yep, so we, we eventually moved, moved on to better garbage bags. <laughs> I, mean, I remember bags. they were heavier bags, you know, dry bags, I have photos <laughs> of that. But that shows you the garbage bag and the bungee nets. Bungee nets, actually, when I started riding, bungee nets didn't exist. And so bungee nets were like, wow, technology, this is awesome. But you can see still that we were pretty, you know, in the dark ages. Um, yeah, let me go, I'll go back to that one. So this goes, this is the beginning of my touring uh, with, and with camping as well. This is my friend Chuck, who now lives in Holland. And we both had these uh, Honda CB900s. And we went to, this is probably the trip either to Newfoundland or one of the many trips we took together to Prince Edward Island. And, you know, this is again, all the stuff that we had in there is all our camping gear for, you know, 10 days. And of course, when it was just the two of us, we could, we could pack pretty light. Um, but on the back of my bike would be just bungeed a bunch of, you know, 
all the sleeping bag and all that stuff is in there. But so that goes back to, you know, whatever this was, 1984, I think. Uh, then we start getting into uh, the trips where Janine's a little bit old. This is the 2004 trip, right? So you can see right here uh, on my bike, which is the red VFR, that we had a, a, a large um, dry bag that was I put vertically. Now this is the same backrest we used when she was um, uh, when she was little, but we took off the arms, and uh, so this was mounted vertically on, on this tall sort of sissy bar. Uh, and you would think, wow, that sure does put a lot of weight up high. Well, it's like I was carrying in that yellow bag, uh, the sleeping bags. So it was not very heavy. Uh, so it, it really looks more ridiculous than it is or unstable, but it's not. And again, Carolyn's got uh, the, she's being the mule again with all the, the big tent. Now, I also want to point out the tent that we had at the time. I probably have it here. This is uh, on that same trip. And that tent is ridiculously large for six, riding on a motorcycle. Six-man tent. But it meant that we could all sleep on one end of it and have all our gear and still have room to um, walk around and stand up, particularly if it was rainy or just whatever. And so it was luxurious, but it wasn't that much bulkier than a four-man tent. Yeah, if you do the measuring, it, it's heavy. It definitely added, you know, maybe five or eight pounds. I don't know. Well, I was carrying only maybe 80 pounds on the back of my bike. Right. So when you think of it that way, it's, it's you know, half the weight of a normal type passenger or thereabouts. So it really wasn't too bad. And this YZF actually handled it pretty well. Um, so yeah, it didn't, and it was balanced out pretty well too. So it wasn't that bad, but that tent made it so much more luxurious. We could stand up in it, we could change in it. And right. we had room, we actually, when it was raining, we could sit and play cards in it very mm -hmm. comfortably. Um, so that was why we ended up doing that. And we still have that. And we used it quite a bit when we were kids, uh, when, we, when she was a kid. So there it is again. This is in uh, uh, Nova Scotia. So we did a lot of trips. Now this is actually a little earlier. This is the uh, 750 Ninja. This thing was not good with a lot of weight on the back. Discovered that in North Carolina on the Blue Ridge Parkway, right? It had a little bit more rake and so the front end would get light. It made it really hard to do a U-turn. That's one place I dropped the bike. Yeah. And when I picked it up, I'm like, geez, this thing's dangerous. <laughs> of course, I'm the one responsible for it being, you know, in decent shape for her to ride. And I thought it was going to be fine, but I didn't, didn't jump on it and find out how crazy it was. But she managed. So that was Nova Scotia. This is again back to um, our trip in 2004. Sorry, these are jumping around a little bit. But you can see the, how the bikes are loaded. This is also that trip. And there's, there's that jumbo tent. It's called a, uh, it's a Eureka. It's both the uh, three tents that we've owned have all been Eurekas. And this is the headquarters. They don't sell it anymore, but they sell something similar, I think. This is a later trip. Now this has, is with Janine on her own bike. She's got a sport bike. She's got the Ninja um, ZX6R. And then I had a sportier bike. I had a, this uh, also a, a Kawasaki Ninja 636. And then Carolyn was on a Kawasaki uh, Z750S. So we were on sportier bikes. Carolyn was on, her bike was a little more standard, but you can see it's the same setup in a lot of ways. And, but except with three bikes, now we could, we could actually spread the load a little bit more. And there we are, you know, with the tent, same tent. And the other thing is the tarp. Yeah. Yeah. That was helpful. Um, Cause you could put it over a picnic table or move the picnic table under it just because sometimes it rains and um, you want to be ready for that. And you know, the way you, you hook it up is you, you do, we brought a lot of nylon rope for really long stretches. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see it there going across above the motorcycles. And so we could, cause there were some campsites that were quite open. This one was pretty open and we had to, we had to really use all the, the uh, cord that we had. Um, otherwise we'd use bungee cords and things like that. Um, but this, in this case, we absolutely needed the nylon cord. So we always had that with us. The and, nylon Cord was also good uh, when we were in bear country and had to um, have a duff, we'd plan, we'd have a duffel bag to put all the food in. And then um, one of the bike locks, we would tie to, to the uh, cord and then throw the lock over a branch yeah. and haul the um, duffel bag up into the tree. Um, 
because it's kind of scary when you're in bear country and you can't hide your stuff in a car. And they don't, you know, the places out west have uh, bear bins, you know, the bear lockers. Uh, not everyone does, but but most of them did. Uh, but out in, like this is, I, I don't remember where this is, Blue Ridge Parkway area? Uh, no, this was New York. This was a trip, for Janine's first trip. Yeah. Uh, on, on her, on where she was riding her own bike. So this trip is actually uh, a little earlier than the other one. That's my old race bike, that the one on the left, it's an MZ Scorpion. You don't have to worry about bears all the time. They'll, the campgrounds will warn you. Yeah, but like Carolyn said, very often, I mean, quite often we'd have to take the disc lock and, and fling it up over a, a decent branch and so that we could haul that, you know, all of our food up. Never keep your food in your tent or in your tank bag uh, because if it's a bear or raccoon, they'll get into it. They'll knock your bike over. They'll tear apart your, your luggage. So you've got to make sure that it's, it's out of the way and up high. And it has to be out because the bears will climb up and then they'll get to it if they can reach it. So this is that same trip. Um, and there you can see the bikes a little bit more. They're unloaded. When Janine started riding with us, we had enough room then to carry those three little chairs. And so that's, yeah, the chairs are great. They, I'm actually using them still. Yeah. Uh, when I went camping uh, last week and I went out just for an overnight, I brought one of those chairs and I'm so glad I did. So they're just old chairs that, you know, they weigh about, I actually weighed them less than three pounds. So they're, they're basic, but they work well. And it's that same trip. And you can see now a little bit different, better how they were all loaded. Soft luggage. Now you can talk about hard luggage and soft luggage. Soft luggage actually has a lot of flexibility where you can stuff things in it. You can actually really get odd things in there. Now hard luggage, you know, it, you can as well. And it's also secure and we'd have to always worry about things getting wet. So we would, we would have our rain covers and stuff, which really sucked. The, uh, I would absolutely recommend hard luggage if you, if, you know, and, you know, but it's not quite as flexible. There are times when we really were able to, to get things in that I think we would have had struggle, uh, struggle with, with a hard walled um, case. Some of those bags were expandable too, which was helpful. Right. Yeah, just means bringing more stuff. <laughs> right. You gotta be careful of that a lot of people get the the jumbo bags and they'll you know then you just you're tempted to fill them. Um, there's a thing I know Tim Collins who uh, John was talking about. He's got a book coming out about camping, about moto camping, and uh, Brett Tax also he had a video recently and he showed what he takes and he goes abroad and what he takes he fits easily in two saddle bags and a um, and a duffel and that's it. So. And he always says that, that basically you, you pick the clothes that uh, you can wash easily in a sink and they'll dry really quick. So, and they're very light and they pack up, they don't wrinkle, or if they do, it's not a big deal. So nylon things and uh, you know, like uh, hiker pants. No jeans. No jeans, jeans are heavy. They get, when they get wet, they're useless. So, you know, be really smart about that. Um, and not too many shoes, you know, I will usually pair, bring a pair of sandals maybe, and then a pair of walking shoes, but we have our boots too. So those, that actually makes three. Um, depends on where we're going also. So now you can see how our, our tarp is configured um, in this case. And this was on that same trip and it rained pretty good, but this is what we were, it was like underneath, lousy photo, but we were sitting under it reading uh, and it was really, really comfortable. Um, so that, that is an indicator, it shows you just how, um, you know, how comfortable you can be if you're prepared. So this is a later trip. This was one where, uh, when uh, again, Janine had her the same green bike, Carolyn had her blue bike, and I had this Triumph. And this was another trip. This was down to Blue Ridge Parkway, which is one of our favorite places to go. And we go to this place called Willville. Uh, and I wanna show you a photo of that place in a second. And I'll talk it's more about it. It's a motorcycle only campground, and there are a few down there. It's near Mabry Mill off of the parkway. Um, but here's another example. This was on, on that trip, the Blue Ridge Parkway trip. Uh, and you can see it's rains, man. You know, but if you're prepared, it's actually, it's actually enjoyable. You know, we're dry, dry enough anyhow. And you know, we've got all our stuff. And we'll, we'll just get comfortable, we'll read, we'll drink coffee. And you know, I'll talk a bit about what food we tend to bring as well, uh, when that time comes. So this is Willville. And it, it's called Willville because the, the owner, his name is Will. And he's a really great guy, motorcycle only. They, he holds events there often. 
and it's just a great place to be. He doesn't even allow vehicles down into the camping area, um, but he will, I've uh, towed down to there and then he'd let me leave the truck outside of the, uh, uh, of the property. And he has a fire ring at night yeah. and uh, people gather around if they want to and he puts out little tiki, can um, <laughs> tiki lights around. It's just a fun, yeah. relaxed place to be. And he's got a big porch, so he has coffee there in the morning. And, you know, it's these are the things that you don't get in a motel, you know. Uh, and this is an engagement that really in the environment and in, with people. Uh, he does have cabins, which we did take advantage of uh, one year. But again, you can see our tarp. And uh, we did cover the bikes there for a while. I don't really do that anymore. So this is another campsite. And you can see now... Uh, a very different environment where there's a lot of other campers around, families, and that's, so that's another thing about variety in the, in the campgrounds that you uh, go to and that you stumble upon. And some are like really, you know, private and some aren't. But you know what? They're all great. And sometimes you, you might have some loud people, but we don't really remember a whole lot of that, do you? Except those little girls singing my humps. <laughs> yeah, the little girls walking through the campground. My humps, my humps, my lady lumps. It's like, they had no idea what they were saying, but it was hilarious. So, oh, I guess that's my, last, that's my last one. So that's okay. So this is our camper now. This is what we do for camping. And we do bring our XT250s with us. So we're, it's still a moto camping trip. It's just that we're in the lap of luxury now. And we're kind of liking it. So... But like I say, I went camping last week for the same reason that I that we recommend you try camping. It's really it's another, it's a real and you, know, you you are in the environment in a different way, and again that little discomfort builds character. So, oh, we'll talk a bit more about that. Let me uh, get back and and we can uh, stop sharing. Okay, so hope that was fun for you. It's fun for us to think back on some of those trips. Um, let me look at a couple of my notes and I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about. But then I think, John, if uh, you have any questions that are there, I see you've got four Q&A. All right. So that's good. I do. I do. Yeah. Do you want me to read some to you now, Ken? Let's do it. Oh, that's fantastic. So and there are actually uh, quite a few questions already on, uh, on food. And uh, the first one is, is uh, from uh, Ciro. Uh, and it says, uh, hi, the biggest question is food. How do you plan meals, purchase food, cook, and everything else? Well, one of the, we tended to eat lunch out and most dinners um, and have our breakfast in the campground. So we usually had uh, instant oatmeal and we had a little coffee, drip coffee, um, you know, just a single cup kind of. So we had a little kind uh, MSR camp stove with um, a little canister and we could heat up water and it, it was really well really good it was nice to do it in the campsite yeah so the breakfast was easy it was just boiling water so we would get coffee and uh, and uh, instant oatmeal and we'd bring I remember I like having like walnuts in mine so we'll put walnuts in it and we'd have you know as far as cooking utensils like I said, we didn't plan on doing big meals at night. I know some people do that. They love doing camp meals, but we would tend to find a, a restaurant for that. Uh, however, there were times, I mean, the, the beans and hot dogs is what I did last week, and it's awesome, you know, and all you need to do is, is have the stove uh, that we have. It's an MSR. Uh, the one we have now is doesn't have use the canisters. It, well, it uses a can, a can of white fuel, and you screw it on, and it's a, you know, it assembles it, packs down to like this big, and then the canisters, a small one or a bigger one, whatever you want to get. So as far as cooking goes, that's what you use, is you use a white stove, white fuel stove. Um, there are a lot of options there. But again, the, your whole point about riding a motorcycle is that you want to conserve space, space and weight. So uh, backpacking stuff is great. However, you don't have to go that extreme. I've camped cooking over a fire in the past, but that usually has... Um, uses like a cast iron pan and that's too heavy. You can get um, little camping kits um, with pot and fry pan, all stainless, you know, pretty lightweight. So you really could camp cooking if you wanted 
um, just look into what recipes you want to do and do them over your stove or there you can cook over a fire. Um, now, you if know, you do there's just a lot of options if you wanted to go to that point. We usually were traveling so much mm -hmm. that um, we might not even get into our campsite until after supper. So we would just stop on the road and eat supper. Yeah, because you don't want to set up your tent angry. <laughs> hang, angry. Uh, if you're hungry, it's, you know, it's stressful sometimes enough to like get all the things set up that uh, if you're hungry, it's not good. So plan your stops so that you're either in your campsite early if you're gonna if you're planning on cooking and get yourself set up and then do your cooking and it'll be much more relaxed but make sure you're not starving because you will get you'll rip each other's lungs out <laughs> if uh you know if, if you're sort of, yeah 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 that's eating. so funny you know in regard to what uh, carolyn said eating out is uh saves you from having to put up a bear bag uh also over a tree because uh, you don't bring your food back to the tent with you and whatever you're going to have for breakfast the next morning is uh, uh, is, is uh, not cooked or is dehydrated. But uh, the second uh, question, uh, guys, is what are your favorite meals uh, to cook using minimal gear? Uh, are there any other uh, cooking tips? Uh, so if you, these are things that I've had other people do more. Again, we're going to cop out on this a little bit because we, we take the easy part, the easy way for uh, cooking. But if one thing I'll say is if you do use a pan over a fire, uh, soap it up, like put, um, what do you call it, dish soap along the bottom of it. And then it'll, the, um, the soot is easily wiped off. If you don't, then that soot will, will become the, the bottom of your pot. And then it gets everywhere. Like that soot will get on your hands, it'll get on everything in, uh, you know, that, you, that it touches. So that's a little tip. Um, uh, as far as you know, the things that we have done, like there's, if you, take, if you have corn on the cob, which you can find on, uh, on the road, on roadside stands all the time, and you have aluminum foil, you just wrap it in foil if you put some butter or some oil in it, uh, or even a little water so it steams and then wrap it up real tight, you can put it right either on a grate over the fire or in the fire. And that, that's really great. And it doesn't take very long. You just get it so it's tender. And if so, you'll have to remember to bring some aluminum foil if that's your plan. That, you, you can bring it. You don't have to bring the whole thing, the whole box. You take out a whole bunch and then you fold it all up. And so that it's not obviously, uh, you know, so, that it's, so you can actually unfold it and use it. Um, like that's a, way, that's a great way to uh, think about how you pack for motorcycle camping. If you want to cook a um, dinner, there's, there's a lot of recipes out there. I mean, you can cook eggs. You can take a look, have a little six pack of uh, eggs. Um, you can do chili. I mean, there's just a lot of options. It's not unreasonable. It's like cooking over your, over your stove is like cooking over your grill. Um, there's just a lot of things you can do. And the foil is a good one because you could cook fish, you could cook mm -hmm. vegetables. Um, you can actually, if you had a fire, you can uh, put potatoes in the uh, hot coals. Um, cut cut them up really fine, though, because potatoes take forever to there's cook. There's meals in foil. Yeah. There are a lot of options. So the meal, the, Carolyn just reminded me of the more of the foil uh, type meals. Is That's what uh, my friend Chuck, who you saw you know, when we went up to Newfoundland back, way back in the day, he would make foil meals, and that's how he would do it. And we he just put in things like vegetables and uh, you know like potatoes and I forget what else he used to put something in there. But even if you just put in like cut up hot dogs, you know, and you put it in there, you put it in foil, and you just you really just looking to have the foil is your oven. So you just make it so that it doesn't you don't put it directly in the fire, uh, but close is enough, you know, and then turn it around and that kind of thing. Depending on how you um, what you're packing, you can have like a collapsible. Um, cooler and stop somewhere and get food on your way for that evening. I wouldn't uh, stock up for anything except what we did carry was pretty much oatmeal for at least a week and um, coffee, you know, so we had things like that and we had snack food. And little um, creamers. Right. Like, you know, Rob creamers from uh, McDonald's or something like that, you know, you don't need that many. Uh, the little cooler is great. That's actually we found. I found the one that we uh, that I'm going to be using. Tony and I are going camping for a week uh, in August, and I'm trying to gather my stuff together. And we found this. Now the cooler is it's the same thing. It's like this big though, right? It packs down real small, which is perfect. 
but it's not a lot. So it would put like six eggs in there if you bought a half a dozen of eggs. Uh, you know, uh, so it would hold just a little bit. And again, what do you do with ice? Well, if you buy it from the store, just almost like you're going to be at your campground, like in the next, um, within the hour, no big deal. Just put it in there and then, you, you know, it's still cold enough. Um, and, but if you do need some ice, we were talking about this is to go into McDonald's and just use, you know, get some ice in a cup and then do that, you know. And, Although if you're in a grocery store, sometimes they'll give you a little bag of ice. That too. Good idea. Um, canned food, you can think about that, but canned food is heavy. So there are some that can work out fine, but you don't have to go crazy. Like you don't have to get dehydrated food and like the backpacker lifestyle. You don't right. have to do that. Uh, and knowing that we're in America, we are not in Zimbabwe, you know, where you can't find grocery stores and Walmart is everywhere. Uh, and so you, you just, you pick up what you want and you, what you need for that night. So it's really not very difficult. All you're really looking to do is find an efficient and easy way to get heat and uh, campfires are a pain in the neck and they smell and everything else. So frankly, I've, you know, they're fun for s'mores just for if you're bored and you like looking at fun. <laughs> but uh, frankly, it's, uh, we like the, uh, the gas stove. It's just clean, it's quick and it boils water quick and it heats up beans and hot dogs quick and chili. And so hope that answers the question. That's a, that's a good question too. And you know, I, one of my favorite, uh, pieces of equipment to take uh, moto camping is I have a, a something called a jet boil and oh, yeah. it takes a, a propane canister a very small propane canister and uh, I've never seen anything boil water so quickly it looks like the base of an MSR stove but it has a quart uh, container and it even changes color when the water boils which is usually in about 90 seconds believe it or not That's and cool. uh, I use that for a lot of dehydrated so, food yeah uh, so, uh, it's called a jet a jet um, stove. Yeah, Google that. Some people make those too, <laughs> handmade, you know, uh, homemade. But that's great. That's an excellent. Yeah. And, and Ken, now let me ask, uh, do you want to have some more questions now or do you want to hold some till the end? Now let's keep asking questions because I think this is a great way for us to hit our marks. I'm actually crossing things off as we go. So let's keep. Oh, going. that's fantastic. Okay. Well, uh, uh, one of our anonymous attendees wants to know where is Willville located? It's uh, right off the Blue Ridge Parkway, right near Mabry Mill. Mabry Mill is, is the most photographed um, site on the Blue Ridge Parkway, at least that's what they claim. Uh, it's in Virginia. Isn't it near Dan uh, Danville? No, um, no. Uh, I can't think of the name of the town. Oh, it's just willville.com, I'm pretty sure. Just a Willville Motorcycle Camp on Google and you'll find it. Tell them we sent you. It's a great place. We really enjoy it very, very much. Yeah. But Virginia. So it's, it's actually on the very southern part of Virginia, so it's almost in North Carolina. And uh, another question about food, and you've answered some of this already, is uh, uh, from Samsung uh, SM, uh, is uh, what, uh, what were you cooking with your kitchen stuff? Uh, is it the same as hiking uh, boiled water for dehydrated meals and stuff like that? Yeah, so we did answer a lot of that. And I do want to point out that the dehydrated meals thing like I say, that's really an extreme. You don't need to do that. That stuff, unless you like it. I don't, you know, I'm not interested in that uh, because we're on motorcycles. We're not on bicycles and we're not hiking, you know, the Appalachian Trail or anything that just save, know that you, well, in general, when you pack, you should have some space available for something like that, that you want to pick up and throw in, the, in your, whatever your top box or Maybe you have a little backpack that you, that you keep folded up and tucked away, but when you want your food, you can put your food in your backpack and put it on and just get to the camp right, campground. And bungee nets are great yeah. for hauling a, a paper bag or plastic bag of groceries right. with you. So, you know, that's what we would do. And, but it's pretty much, when it comes to cooking, it's boiling water or it's heating something in a pan. Well, we do have, uh, Carolyn mentioned uh, some pans that uh, we have that were camping pans and they nest into each other. There's a pot, like a big pot, and then it has a little clamp on handle. And actually you bought some others that fold in and they're actually copper at the bottom. So they're nice. Uh, if you could put those over your, your open fire, make sure you soap those up. Uh, and then it has, we have a uh, Teflon pan, mm -hmm. even the, a fry pan for eggs uh, and for anything. I mean, I've, I've definitely cooked, you know, a, 
a hamburger on, on over fire. And I, and that's something you can cook over a, a campfire, but you want to have a grate. Don't, don't stick it in the fire, obviously. And be careful your pans, the handles get hot because they're not, uh, they're not necessarily uh, the safety handles that you find at home. And that's a great, uh, great answer guys. And, uh, uh, Weston Lorenz, uh, asks, have you ever thought about stringing a tarp between your bikes and using it as a tent? Uh, I have a tall BMW and have considered using it as a tent pole uh, to make a lean-to. I've never done it, but I've always thought of it. What do you think? Um, you can do that, and there are people who backpack with um, little bivy sacks or whatever they're called. Um, I just was never into that. I like to have uh, something on the ground under me. I don't like the bugs coming in, but, you know, there are different ways of camping well i think what you're asking is whether like how we uh, did it with the tarp is we always found you know with our cord found trees to hang our our tarp um, but i have known people that have used their bike and i did it a couple times on you know trips away a long long time ago um, and it, it works okay in a pinch you know if there's no tree around but like i say i like the option of getting it set up so it's high because now understand that when it rains the, if you have your tarp flat, it's going to fill with water and it's just going to sag and it's going to pull your bike over. And I've actually heard people, uh, heard that happen with enough rain that it, if you don't get it just right and your bike does, isn't leaning uh, enough on the side stand, uh, that it can actually have enough weight that it'll pull the bike over. I know it sounds kind of far-fetched, but no, it, it'll happen. I do also want to point out that if you park in grass, make sure you put a puck under your side stand because, uh, you know, and oftentimes we're parking in grass. And uh, there was one time that I had my, it was my 900F uh, on the center stand. And because the way the center stand was, I thought that was the most secure way for it to be. But the way the center stand was, you know, it's got the two points like this. And then this one was where the, the lever is. Well, this side started sinking in as it rained because it was pouring rain. So the ground got more and more saturated. And the bike, I was having to be sitting like with my back against the bike, wondering why I was getting pushed forward. And so I ended up pushing it back up. and you know, we sorted it out because I, my friends were with me. So, uh, but anyhow, you know, sure. Why not? We also have also, uh, have brought a spare pole mm -hmm. with a yes. tennis ball. Right. Right. That was really helpful. It was a collapsible pole with a tennis ball with a X cut in it so that you could stick it on the, on that. And then we would put the pole on the picnic table uh, and, and the, that would keep the tent, the, um, tarp up. Right, and the, ten the reason for the tennis ball is you didn't want the, the poles uh, poking through your, your uh, tarp. So the tennis ball made it so that it was a ball that, uh, you know, that, that didn't let that happen. And it's a tennis ball. And actually, we would throw it around. Right, when Janine was little, we'd use it as a ball to throw around. Uh, so that's a way. And then you put it, like Jean uh, Carolyn says, you put it on the picnic table, and then that gives you now a peak. And that works out. We have attached our tent, our, our uh, tarp to our tent, the big tent. Because it's a tall tent. Because it's a tall tent and it had little rings. And it also made it a vestibule so that we could actually walk, if it was raining, we could walk from the tent out into the picnic table and not get wet. Uh, so, you know, it's all about the site. Every site was different. So, so we had to carry a lot of um, nylon rope, which was pretty thin rope, but yeah. pretty sturdy. It packs to like this, you know, it's, it's the white nylon rope. Um, it's, thin, it's thin, strong though. Uh, the uh, other, Carolyn brought up something that I did want to point out that hopefully somebody will ask. I want to make sure that I hit all this stuff, that whether it's asked or not, is that you need a ground cloth under your tent uh, because even if it's not wet, the moisture of, of the ground it, with you in it, and it just, it, it'll make the bottom of your tent soaked. So we, we always add, it's just a, you know, whatever, five mil, you know, um, clear plastic that we just tuck in with our, uh, our tent bag when it's all rolled up. It also helped protect the bottom of the tent from pokey yeah. rocks or right. things. Exactly. Not to be confused with Pokemon. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, hey, I have a question. Uh, have either of you, Carolyn or Ken, uh, ever tried hammock camping. This is a whole new thing that I never even heard about. Nope. I I know people that swear by it. There was a guy at Willville a couple of years ago. I don't even remember him. He That's what he did. Oh, actually, no. I did a solo motorcycle trip a few years ago uh, down the Blue Ridge Parkway, which was 
another really enjoyable thing doing it solo. If you've always done it with, with people, do it solo. It's a whole other experience. It really is. Anyhow, this one guy I met, that's all he did. And he was hanging from a tree, essentially. And he loved it. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it looks it looks so comfortable, but I know if I did it, I'd be wrapped up and, and uh, on the ground in a matter of minutes. Uh, <laughs> Todd Bryant asks, uh, with the pandemic, have you guys slowed down at all? Well, yeah, we're, we're not going to do a trip this fall that we were planning on, um, but hopefully we'll do a winter trip. Well, we were supposed to be in Italy in June, in, uh, June with beaches, you know, adventure tours, and uh, we, we had to cancel that. We rescheduled for next May, so hopefully that'll happen. Uh, but as far as uh, when it comes to motorcycling, yeah, it slowed us down a while, but we've sort of, I, you know, I'm, I've got students. I had three, I had four students on Monday. We had a great time. We social distanced. There are places that are open and they're really good, at least in the Northeast up in, in Vermont, really good about uh, all the precautions. Uh, and so I feel really comfortable with what they've been doing and I'm responsible. I feel responsible for my students and I think we did really good. Uh, and let's say campgrounds are open. When I went up to Vermont, I was wondering, you know, because I actually did some research before I left, and it ends up that out in Western Mass, where we live, that they said that our county did not need to quarantine or go through these, like you have to come with a proof of a test or all that. Uh, but I, they weren't even, they didn't even really care. They just wanted me to sign a waiver saying that I was not sick, and that was fine. And, but the Vermont campsites are all campgrounds, the state ones are open. So. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I use an application, uh, you know, obviously I use the KOA application all the time, but there's another really neat thing if you're going to do wild camping, uh, and it's called iOverlander, and it's uh, a recommended spots by, by motorcyclists uh, who have gone before us and uh, see, and uh, you can download it from the Apple store. And uh, it's kind of a neat thing because you may see someone that you know who's been in an area and, um, you know, and they range everywhere from Walmart, Walmart parking lots to really nice uh, woodsy camping spots. And uh, so it, it's kind of neat. Uh, you know, Philip, uh, Philip Keys is asking, what's the one or two pieces of gear that one wouldn't think uh, that would really make a difference but save your butt? Yeah, I guess you'd have to define what saving your butt is. If it was a safety thing, then, you know, that's one thing. But I think you're probably referring to having, ensuring that you have a good time. And I will say that you have to be prepared for uh, bad weather. We were on a trip back from the uh, Blue Ridge Parkway and the forecast was for a hurricane. We had dodged it most of the way, uh, but it, we had to be back for work. And so there was no real option for us to sit it out. We did sit it out one day, uh, but that was all we could really do. And so I would say that you need nowadays, this is again more, it's more easy to do now, but is to really have a good weather app with radar and you can dodge uh, weather. So I'd say that was a really helpful thing. Well, that, that trip we, because we didn't have smartphones back then, we um, bought a weather radio and that last night, um, we had 200 miles to go to um, where we had parked the car at our friend's house. And so we stayed with, in a motel. With the trailer. Yeah. We had um, stayed in a motel that night and watched TV and I couldn't sleep and worrying that we were going to hydroplane. But, um, you know, if it felt dangerous, we had planned we would pull over and, and stay in another motel. Well, the hurricane was coming up the coast. And it was, we, it was pouring rain and we got up in the morning and we got on the bikes and it was fine. It was um, windy. It, ended up it was there windy was a, and gusty, but yeah. all the people in cars were giving us lots of room. Um, never it, after that have I been afraid of a rainstorm. <laughs> yeah. And there was a tornado had touched down. We found out later, not terribly far from us, but Janine was on the back and she was happy. Like we stopped at a rest area at one point and we got off and it was torrential rain and it says, come on, Janine, let's go. She goes, no, I'm good. So she's just, just sitting on the back with her little backrest and we ran in, used the bathroom and then people were looking out the window and we were saying, listen, we asked her to come in. She's not being punished or anything, you know? Um, 
But to answer your question in another way is that what saved our butts, it's really being prepared uh, with gear that's gonna keep you warm and dry. Because if you get wet and it gets even below like 60 degrees and you're wet, it, you're gonna be miserable. And now you've got a danger. You've got a, uh, uh, a danger of not necessarily hypothermia, but of distraction and that can be really dangerous. Uh, as far as comfort goes. My, I wear leggings when I ride now um, because the riding pants that I have are like Cordura and there's not much give in them and I don't want um, cloth jeans, um, I mean, even shorts. I'm, I want something stretchy and the leggings, I wouldn't ride without them, even a day ride. That's, that's uh, number one for me. Um, so I think having enough riding experience to know what makes you comfortable on the bike. Ken uses an air hawk, and that's been really helpful for him for a seat that's not that comfortable. Um, yeah, I just don't have a butt with any padding. That's right. my big problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. And so what do you guys use? Do you use a, a Gore-Tex like fabric or do you put rain gear on over uh, your riding gear when you're uh, encountering rain? I have, um, I, that, that's a good point. I would always, I always take a rain suit because I don't want my riding um, jacket and pants to be soaking wet and then get in a tent with them soaking wet. So um, I always take a rain suit that goes over, over my riding clothes. And that is one thing that I would take. Yeah, so that's the thing about riding gear. We, we can do a whole other webinar on, on riding gear, but uh, I tend to also do the same thing as we have an over, uh, over um, rain gear because even though my jacket uh, is waterproof, it's the liner that keeps me dry. The jacket, so it gets soaked. And it, when, it, when that happens, it gets cold uh, also. So again, that's why another layer. Layers is the key. To staying warm and thin layers don't get jeans and don't wear a lot of cotton you know that's why we, we wear an awful lot of like um, high performance technical um sort of um, long sleeve you know shirts and and um and leggings and things like that uh i actually i actually see some of the questions here there's some good questions we've got yeah so and the next question is from uh, richard ward and uh, he asks and this is a simple question but uh, it's near and dear to my old back air mattress or sleeping pad? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, sleeping pad is probably, there's a lot of variations. Um, we started out with, with the old fashioned air mattress and we actually took a little compressor with us um, to blow them up. But then we got the, um, the little higher tech ones that were more of a sleeping pad and you could, it would, um, when you unrolled it, it would bring in air and you could add a little bit more. Um, and then we got something different. So you can see a lot of experimenting to see what would work. Um, and a lot of it is technology just got better. When I was working at Twisted Throttle, they were selling uh, Nemo stuff, which Nemo stuff is really good as a brand, hence. And they had this air mattresses that are now what we use. And they are real air mattresses that get, they're about this thick. And, you know, it's easy. They're really easy to actually come with a foot pump built in. So no blowing into it. That I always hated that. Um, and uh, they pack down like this, lo this long and like that far, that big. So I can, they're, it's so small. So, uh, and I'm quite sure you can still get those. I don't know if Twisted Throttle sells those anymore. Um, but Nemo. Uh, and the, the ones that Carolyn were talking about, about their kind of pads with air, they were kind of a hybrid thing that uh, EMS um, sort of made for a while, but they were the blue ones that you saw in the photos and they're like this big around and like that long. So there are many, many much better choices now just because of technology. So, yeah, so that yeah, was neat. one thing we've experimented with over the years. And, and uh, yeah, it's a good thing. What, what have you gotten the best night's sleep on, guys? Uh, this current thing that I have, no doubt about it. It's a Nemo? Yeah, the Nemo. And then, um, you know, sometimes people will use clothes for a pillow, but that never worked for me. So we had 14-inch um, square pillows that you could get at Joanne Fabric, you know, like a, a couch pillow. And then you, we got an air Yeah, we got these. Air pillow. I think this is also, it might be a Nemo thing, but they're actual pillows and they've got a, like a fleece face on them. 
and they have a little pouch where you can like shove like clothes in there to make them bigger, but they also uh, blow up with air. So, and they're, they're about like, I don't know, 18 inches by 12 inches and they pack like this. You can actually roll them up, but they're really uh, uh, thin. And you, then they have like a bungee, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, any, where you can build it up and you can make the pillow as almost as tall as a regular pillow. And then we bring a pillowcase just to keep it clean. One of the things about the high-tech um, air mattresses that they have now is when it's cold out, the old air mattress where it was just air was really cold because the, the air under you was cold. And so um, I camped a few times out at AmeriCade by myself and discovered how cold you could be. Um, now, to keep warm, have a knit hat. Right. Like that is what is what if always have one because your whatever sleeping bag you have well you know it may or may not be warm enough for the the temperatures and you just might get caught out but if you get to keep your head warm that's why mummy bags are so warm so you can tuck yourself in there but a knit hat does are just an amazing thing but yeah. you do want to think about what Carolyn's saying is that the air under you is going to get cold. So those old air mattresses that we used to use, that air would eventually get cold. And that's why you wanna actually have something insulated between you and your sleeping pad. Even this one that we have now, it is air. So we need to have But those that. have a little more insulation in them yeah. than the old um, air mattress. Yeah. Right, so, some of the new ones that I've seen actually have uh, our values uh, right. on them. Yeah. Those that, are that's interesting. Things. Right. Yep. That's interesting. So uh, Patrick Orvis asks, uh, this is a really good question. With regard to first aid kits, do you put your own together or just buy a standard first aid kit? Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts tonight, guys. So um, I'm, I'm really aware of the need for first aid kits. So I've bought, we have several of them. Um, I've bought a standard kit and then looked in it and added to it. Um, so you can get as fancy as you want. You can find all kinds of, of uh, first aid kits online. Just think about the kinds of things that you might need um, on the road. And, and you might want one of those little um, cold packs that you break and it's cold. You know, if, if you do have an injury and you're with a partner and you, you know, they can help you out, um, help might not come right away, so you want to be ready. Not that you need, um, you know, super, I mean, we're in civilization, we're not out in the backwoods. Yeah, and uh, a tourniquet, they make those really uh, sort of portable tourniquets, that's something that, you know, it doesn't take up a lot of room. I don't think we have one, uh, but that's something I know that when I took an off-road course that they really recommended you have, because um, you are oftentimes out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. when you do an off-road. Right. Um, I actually noticed Walt Fulton is here. Hey, Walt, great to see you. Um, thanks for coming by. He's got the the uh, the coordinates for uh, Willville right there on in the Meadows chat. of Dan. Yeah, Meadows of Dan. Is. Mile right. marker Thank 177. You, so whoever asked that, mile marker 177.7 actually. Uh, Meadows of Dan. Okay, highly recommend them. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, Phil Keys has a couple of questions, uh, and I'll just combine them. Um, the first uh, set is, what are your top camping destinations in New England? And uh, the second part of the question is, is what were your best camping experiences and your worst? <laughs> hmm. Well, in New England, um, what, one of the other things about camping is that you can stay in one place for a while or you can move um, from day to day. So we have done both and we've done combinations. Um, we've done quite a few trips early on where we moved camp every day and that got kind of tiring after a while. So we would plan into the trip two nights in one spot and do a day trip from there, which that worked a lot better. And we've also gone camping um, Rangeley Lakes area up in uh, Maine where we stayed there, well, we. We stayed there a few nights, I think, and then we kept moving and we, we got all the way out to Acadia. That was a fun trip. Yeah, the Acadia, Rangeley, that, that's really neat if you've not been out there. Uh, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, I did, that was where I did a lot of my first camping. Uh, that's really great. 
the and as far as specific places, we've done more camping outside of New England than we've done in, I think. Uh, but I just stayed in Vermont. It's uh, uh, Emerald Lake, and there's you, you're not camping on the lake, by the way. There's it gives you this vision of you camping on an Emerald Lake. Well, the campground is is off quite a ways, uh, but you know the the state national parks the state uh, i'm sorry the state parks we like a lot in vermont they're they're but one thing about that that we mentioned earlier is that like motels sometimes state parks can be actually almost the same and then your sites are, are obviously different but you know you can count on the same bathrooms the same you know uh, f uh amenities and that sort of thing so uh, it's actually kind of comforting but, but we don't um we don't tend to camp in the private campgrounds when we're motorcycle camping because it you're in amongst RVs and trailers, et cetera. Um, so we do prefer the state parks when we're on a long trip and um, national parks too, because we like to be outdoors in the woods. Yeah. So that's, and as far as uh, to answer your question a little bit more that, uh, it, if I were to, Vermont is one of my favorite places to be. I mean, I just can be there. The Northeast Kingdom is really great, uh, but going in, going up there and then going across to Maine, that's a really great trip. I like that a lot. Um, uh, as far as our best and worst, I would say the best trip we did, even though it was also just a whirlwind, was this trip we did out west. Right. You know, the, we trailered to Denver and then we did this. We just saw so much and being, it was our first time out there. So the desert was like, it was like we were on Mars and we just had such a great time. As far as the worst goes, we did have one that it was just rainy. It just freaking rained. Actually, I don't know. I'll tell you one about mine is that we went up to uh, Gaspé, Gas Bay, Gas Bay Peninsula. And this was with my friends, Chuck and, and Billy, who my first people, first friends who turned me on to motorcycle camping. And we were up there and, you know, Gas Bay Peninsula is great. We left in the rain and it didn't let up. I mean, for 10 days, actually one day it let up and we, and we got off, we got out and we looked, we, we rode around the, uh, the uh, peninsula, but we were under a blue tarp for days and it was almost like Chinese water torture. I swear we, 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 we were going, driving ourselves nuts. We just had to get out of there. So that was my, I think my worst trip. But I think in all the years that we and you have been camping, that was probably the only time that was ever like that, so yeah. miserable. And Gas Bay Peninsula is well known for that kind of weather. Yeah, the Maritimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I went out to Newfoundland with those guys, we had awesome weather, so it's kind of unpredictable. And Nova we, Scotia was great yeah, weather. Yeah, so we're always prepared though, because the Maritimes are always that way. Uh, what type of trailer do we use for our bike? Alan, I see that here, I'll just answer that. That, when we had then, we had an old open, of three rail open trailer, we used two of the rails. That was what we did back then, that was an 05. I mean, now I've, I've got an enclosed trailer, but even now when we use our camper, we put the bikes in the back of the truck. So this person asks, um, how do you clean parts and cookware? And you didn't mention the tools that you took, take and being able to lube the chain and things like that. Right, so uh, as far as cleaning the cookware, that's something that we bring a, there's a, a plastic, you know, scrubby thing. With, with a little soap, like the dish little soap. ones, dish soaps, little travel ones. And that's pretty much what that does. And then the campgrounds have a sink for doing that, for doing your dishes. Uh, and there's always water, you know, so that's how you do that. Um, the tools Carolyn was, had brought up is that, yeah, you do need to bring some tools. And so you have to have some space for that. Uh, chain lube, if you're on a long trip, because you really do want to chain, if you have a chain, uh, you want to make sure you maintain that every, you know, few hundred miles, you want to shoot some lube on that. And we always had bikes with, with chains. Um, so there's that. But also you want to have, you know, a, I always bring, make sure we have a Leatherman. And that's come in pretty handy. Uh, just that simple tool right there. We're on bikes now that are really reliable. We have a stop and go plug, you know, tire plug kit. That's under the seat. It's always with me. It never goes anywhere. So I don't even have to think about it. We also have the little it. canisters. Yep, the little CO2 canisters, which you need to, to blow it up because you can plug the tire. And if you don't have anything to blow it up with, then you're, you're still stuck. So the CO2 cartridges, they don't fill up to the full, um, the full capacity, but it gets you to the gas station. And duct tape? Yeah, just a wire. I, I take a little safety wire and I wrap it around a, um, 
like a roll a roll of uh, electrical tape. So you just kind of take things and you try to find ways of putting them in small packages. Like you don't need a whole roll of duct tape. You take the duct tape off and you wrap it around something, you know, and then you, like a wrench. And so you have the wrench, but now, and that's, now it's a thicker wrench, but you don't not carrying a big thing of duct tape. So that's like another example. Uh, other tools we bring, mostly I make sure that the, the motorcycle toolkit is, is well equipped. And then I'll bring the, the normal things, you know, the 10 millimeter, the 12 millimeter. And if I have a little, a small uh, adjustable wrench and pliers and make sure I got the screwdrivers. Uh, but that's usually takes care of things. I don't think yeah. we've ever had a, anything major like that besides a flat every once in a while. So, so hey, hey, uh, I have a, a statement here, not a question really, but uh, it's from Sue Harris. And uh, she says, I do a lot of motor camp, moto camping, and I carry a jet boil for coffee and oatmeal. Uh, mm -hmm. I have lunch on the road and bring back things for dinner. Uh, which is basically what you guys said. So this has got to be good information. Uh, <laughs> lately, uh, just stop at a grocery store and get a store-baked chicken and a prepared salad. It'll feed three to four people. I always carry silverware, a cloth napkin, a pepper mill, and an unbreakable plate and collapsible bowl. Do you guys ever try those collapsible bowls? We don't use a collapsible bowl. We have little nesting plastic bowls uh, that we bought at a camp store at one point and um, tend to take plastic plates instead of paper plates and just wash them, um, but they take up no room. Um, we use plastic ware and then always take um, like a, a small wooden spoon and a small spatula. I actually put some things in a um, Tupperware container that's kind of a rectangle and I put things in there that I I can just toss them in instead of having them loose anywhere. Um, so that's my kitchen kit, basically. Hot pan holder, you know, just things that really are small that you might, you know, find a need for. And matches and yeah. extra clothes pins so we can hang wet stuff on those nylon lines. Uh. Just a few miscellaneous things. So if you think it through, um, you'll probably come up with your own list. I like the rotisserie chicken idea. I like that a lot. You know, strap yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> sure spill although, well. although just the two of us wouldn't be able to finish one, so then you don't have any way of keeping it. Right. You're going to have to plan on throwing some, some away, unless you have a cooler, you know, that'll carry it. But that's, again, we, we don't want to get too complicated with it. So we'll just get what we can eat that night. I see keeping clean. Campgrounds usually have showers. This is one of Ken's notes. Um, we take an old, to old towel so that they're thinner not a puffy one and a washcloth kind That'll, of kind of threadbare right yeah. right we've used those chamois uh towels they don't get me dry yeah they don't dry you i don't i don't like it. it's weird you know so i we don't use them. they pack down small but I don't, I don't oh know an extra works. thing um is to have an extra towel that can be on the um in the entryway to the tent because if you come in with muddy boots and stuff you want to be able to take them off and wipe your feet on on it's like a um, floor mat, but an it's a mat. towel, it's an a doormat, mat, right? Which you do need it because you will make a mess inside your tent. Right. Uh, speaking of tents, let me get to that real quick. I actually have a photo I'm going to share on my screen of the three different tents that we've owned. So these are the three. This is that big one on the lower left. That's that, uh, that uh, headquarters. The green one is the one I started off with. This, you, they still make these, the Timberline. You can get them in two man, four man, and I think even six man. No, probably two man and four man. They pack down pretty small. This is like, they make them still because they're so like ubiquitous, you know? But if you're buying a tent, my recommendation, like that green one is considered, I think a four man tent. It was only comfortable for two. And when you put your gear in it, like we had soft luggage, so that had to go inside somewhere. Um, it was crowded. So then we got the big tent, the tan one that's shown there without the tarp on it. That's a six man tent and we could fit three of us and have room for all our gear and room to walk around. Now we use the blue one there, which is considered a four man and it's really nice and comfortable for two. Yeah, the square format gives you a lot of room. Uh, you could easily fit three people in there, but it's really great for two people in all of our gear. Now, when we were uh, with the small tent, we would actually have to wrap our gear 
in a tarp and put it under a picnic table. That was when we, when Janine was with us, and that was our tent. And so we had to have a tarp for our gear to be on the. Yeah. It it was kind of miserable. It was. So that's our tents. Uh, Pretty neat. Hey, speaking about tents, Ken, uh, Peter uh, Peter uh, observed uh, that one of the questions reminded him of one of those combination human motorcycle tents where the uh, the motorcycle and gear are both sheltered. I think that's called a rever, if I'm not mistaken. What are those like? Uh, well, those those are they're expensive. First of all, Twisted Throttle sold those for a while, uh, and it's the idea is that you're able to put your motorcycle in a little garage which I don't feel the need for. We used to, there was one of those photos showed us with the, the covers on the bikes and it makes you feel good, but we rode all day in the pouring rain and then put a cover over it, it made well, no sense. I like the covers because sometimes it, the bike was parked under pine trees and you'd get pine sap on it. And that's a good reason to just, if you can't not park under a pine tree, then yeah, you probably want to cover it. But that's, so that's me. So I wouldn't spend the money on that. I would spend the money on it because it's a vestibule which expands your living space. And that's a nice thing, and, but you don't need that. There are a lot of them out there that even you can buy an accessory vestibule that uh, I know with the, the timber lines, that those green tents, our cat wants to get involved here. Um, the, they make an accessory uh, um, sort of vestibule, but you can do that out of a, a tarp. Now I wanna point out the tarp we use is not like the type that you buy at Home Depot. It's a kind of a vinyl, um, nylon. Yeah, it's, it's a, a waterproof nylon. nylon. Bought at a camping store. Yeah, so and it's really nice and it packs down. It's a little heavy, you know, heavy for its its sort of thickness, but it's really durable. It's that blue one that was in the photos that we showed. Do you guys use a foot under your tents? Uh, oh, yeah, well, we use that uh, a ground cloth. Just a plastic. Yeah, one. it's just a plastic, you know, piece of plastic from the hardware store. Yeah. I know. So, ones, you know, special. I have ones. a question. I, I've I've looked at tents uh, from every everything from Hil Hilberg, the tent maker. You know, the real expensive ones that they take on Arctic expeditions to uh, to, to a new. I think Ken, you were telling me about a new brand of mid mid level camping gear from Walmart, and uh, that are supposed to be really accessible and and uh, uh, not expensive. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what are the where should we land as moto campers? So here's always the thing is that with certain things, you do get what you pay for. Uh, that said, I do know that there are some, you don't have to pay $300 for a uh, sleeping bag anymore. Uh, that, you know, you can get away with an $80 sleeping bag, but it's not going to be, it's going to be bulkier. It's going to be heavier and it might really not live up to its claims. Now you can choose when it comes to sleeping bags, you can choose from either down or polyfill. Uh, the advantages of down is that they pack down really small. You can scrunch down a, a sleeping bag to like this big uh, for down, uh, and, but they're more expensive. And they, but the problem with them is that if they get wet, their insulative value goes away. And, it, and then the it down tends to clump and, and it gets to be a problem drying it and having it unclump. So we've, we've always had the, uh, the, the polyfill, but right. we, uh, I have a down one, and that's what I brought last week when I camped, and it, I loved how it packed down, but then actually when I got in it, uh, you know, I liked how light it was, but actually the size of it was a little small for me now, I don't know why, but uh, I would aim, I like the idea of a down one because of how, how light and how small it goes. I would think if, if I was just camping, I would probably try to borrow somebody's for the first time and do a two or three night or somewhere not too far and try it out because I mean we've we've camped I I camped before I met you you camped before you met me we had experiences in with car camping and you with motorcycle camping and um and we've camped for so many years we've gone through different tents different um air mattresses, setups, you know, various things. I would think um, borrow if you can. I wouldn't get the cheapest stuff because it might not, you, it might not function as well as, um, as you would want. And so I don't, wouldn't want you to be um, disappointed because something didn't function very well. Maybe, I don't know, mid-level, 
cost, price. You certainly don't need the ultimate gear. No, and that brings up a point is uh, don't get hung up on needing all the right gear to go camping. Find something. I'm, Tony's going to be borrowing uh, a tent because I, I thought it would be smart for us to each have our own tent. Uh, and he's going to borrow a sleeping bag and an air <laughs> Yeah, I know, really. He snores. <laughs> but uh, uh, now if you do borrow somebody's sleeping bag, that's kind of like, you know, a little personal. Put, bring, bring a line or something you can line in, you know, like a sheet or something so that, you know, you're keeping it clean enough. You can wash sleeping bags, you know, but um, but borrow. But it, just to test it out. If not, don't go, don't worry about it. Find something that's not that expensive. Get out there. It's more important that you get out there and have fun than you have the exact perfect gear. And you're gonna learn a lot and you're gonna actually, like us over the years, you're gonna change. Your preferences are gonna change, your needs are gonna change. So just start where you start and just get out there and have fun because it's awesome. Taking a motorcycle on a camping trip, is there's something special about it because it's you and your motorcycle, especially if you're more than a day away from home. Like you can't get home in one day go far enough that it really feels like like you're uh, away it's an adventure and and don't um avoid motels if you've had a terribly long day you're exhausted you know weather is miserable take a motel yep don't there's no no sin in that uh, and just understand that it's an adventure and, and that you have to roll with whatever that adventure um, um, throws at you uh, bad weather all right Long day in the saddle. Yep. Don't kill yourself. Make sure you eat uh, so you're not hangry. And, uh, and, you know, just be smart. Remember, it's supposed to be fun. If it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. And when you're camping, you, if you can, get to the campsite before dark. Yeah, that really makes It's a hard to set up a tent in the dark. And you might not set it up in a good spot because if it rains, you don't want to be in the dip. Um, you know, so get there before dark. And the other thing I'll say about that is, is um, that uh, plan ahead your day, right? As much as you can, you don't have to do a whole lot, but if you're used to, run, to riding 250 miles in a day and, you know, and you're not exhausted and stuff, well, you do have to plan in, like what Carolyn said, that you've got a lot more work to do once you, once you stop. It's not just about stopping, cracking a beer and sitting down. It probably takes us, I don't remember, I don't know, it probably took me 45 minutes, just me and my one tent to kind of get everything sorted out and the air mattress blown up and, you know, my, uh, my sleeping bag out and then started making a little you know, beans Except and hot dogs. Storm clouds are there. You can and get in pretty fast. Yes. Yeah. If we had to do that, we actually did that quick in the Grand Canyon. But, uh, you know, it's just, you have to keep that in mind. If you don't know it, if you don't know that, then you, you'll kind of get there too late and you're going to feel stressed and it's not going to be fun. Same thing in the morning, striking camp takes time. And so when we did our trips uh, on the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, one I remember where we just moved every day that, uh, you know, we couldn't even get on the road until, I don't know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock even. 10 o'clock. Because it just takes time to get everything packed up. And if you don't take your time packing up, your stuff expands. You end up, if you're not efficient with putting it back the way you had originally put it, which was very efficient and very clean, and if you rush, suddenly everything just seems to expand and explode and you've got suddenly things hanging off your bike and it's terrible. So we've done trips, um, like just to get to Blue Ridge Parkway from our house is, um, to Willville is 700 miles, I think. And so we broke it up in two stretches. It was all highway. We took a motel that night. Um, and coming back one time, it was so hot. We don't tend to travel with camelbacks, but it wouldn't be a bad idea if the weather is going to be hot. Yeah. Um, but we motelled it going down, and then we camped once we were there. And um, we've done trips where we did 300 miles a day, changing campgrounds each night. And that was a bit much. It was a bit harried getting in late. So we tend to like to ride 200, 250 miles which gives us time to have a leisurely lunch, stop and see the sights, have an ice cream in the afternoon, um, get in before dark. Yeah, I would say 150 miles, you know? I mean, you, just because if it's really gonna be really relaxed. But 200 miles, that's, you know, if you got a plan, that's fine, 225. Um, but uh, the planning part is just something that if you've never done it before, that's just a, a heads up. 
on that. Um, one other thing I want to point out is that if when you're camping, you'll oftentimes show up and you won't, you, you're all set up and everything. That's kind of the event for the evening is setting up. And when you sit down, you can reward yourself with a beer, you know, or whatever your, your, your choice is. Uh, if you stop by the, the, uh, the, the store and got yourself a beer or whatever, and you got it, it's cold. That's awesome. Sit down. You, if you want to start a fire, you can do that. Uh, but once it gets dark, we kind of go to bed. <laughs> well, we, we had a little lantern that we would hang in the tent and we could play cards. We'd have headlamps so that we could play cards in the tent, um, read a book. Now you could read a Kindle. Um, right. The Kindle's you know, great for that. But, but yeah. we like to play cards as a family. So anyhow, when it gets, once it gets dark, you, you know, again, it's unless you have a, a lantern, which we do, we've got a few options for lanterns. We've used uh, LED lanterns and uh, battery, operator, ba battery operated ones and uh, rechargeable ones. I like the rechargeable ones actually pretty, pretty well because you can charge those off your bike, you know. So anyhow, is there any I other have, uh, questions? I have a question. Uh, so you both mentioned getting stuck in the rain, and I think it was your Grand Canyon experience, if I'm not mistaken, where it rained really heavily. Um, what? Uh, how do you dry your tent the next morning? What's the best way to get that tent dry? There's nothing like a slimy tent. Good luck, because you're on a trip. We're talking about week-long trips or 10-day trips, and you know it's going to be wet. You you roll it into its you know the wettest part inside. It's not going to get dry. You hope for a dry day, you know, after you've set up again. But the tarp. Um, you know, if, it, if the tent has a tarp over top of it, you put, fold the wet side in on itself. Same with the ground cloth. Um, so you try to keep wet on wet and the inside of the tent stayed dry. Yeah. And that, it, that it, wasn't a problem and it airs out the next night. And if you have that towel, like the, the floor mat towel, mm -hmm. you, you dry it, dry the floor off. That's something because, you know, think about that, a wet floor stinks. Right, right. And Todd Bryant is, uh, is suggesting over in the, uh, uh, chat section that uh, you use a mesh bag uh, or a mesh net on the back of the bike uh, when you're going and it's kind of like a air, air drying the tent. Right. Yep. Like your clothes too because clothes get get uh, get wet. We've done that when we had the bungee net. We would kind of tuck our wet socks or something right. underneath and right. let them flap in the wind. So that, those are a lot of little tricks for uh, um, motorcycle travel that's not specific really to camping. Um, but I'm noticing some of the uh, notes over here in the chat, actually, that uh, down is high maintenance. So I agree. Um, that's something that you have to consider when it comes to, to down as a choice for a sleeping bag. Oh, nice comments. So yeah, they're great comments. Um, permethrin to um, deter bugs, put uh, on the clothes. That's good. So, and, and any bug spray, I, you know, we, there's the stuff that, uh, I don't know what it is. I wish I had thought of it but some kind of bug spray. I didn't need it last week um, because for some reason there were no bugs. I don't know why. I guess it hadn't been raining yet, uh, but now there would be, it'd be pretty buggy. So Somebody you, that'll uses, ruin your, your, your you know, night. Somebody uses a sarong as a towel and also you can wrap in, in it as a cover up. Um, oh, so here's somebody uses a two person tent with two vestibules. I think there are the two that ends. Work. That would work. Sure, That's that would great. work. Sure. Especially if you're alone. Again, two two person tents are really made for one person. They really, as far as the size of people go. Is it cool? Vuz, what's Vuz yeah, makes a, a tent, brand. which it's is a, about two hundred seventy. Yeah, great. So you can see there's there is definitely. Um, can other people see this? Uh, I don't know. Every, everyone could see the uh, chats. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, good. All right. So you guys are looking at this stuff. Um, are any other questions? We I think I've looked at my notes and I think we've hit pretty much everything we need. Yeah, and uh, Todd, Todd is saying that Fuse is actually a moto tent. Oh, the Fuse, yes, the Fuse. I do know about that, that tent. Um, yeah, the, someone's talking about when they're making a lot of miles to uh, motel it, we've definitely done that. Yeah, be smart. You, you can really ruin your day by, by getting fatigued, uh, getting wet, cold, you got. You have to avoid that. That's something that if you can sit out a rainstorm, do it. You know, we've been caught in some torrential rain. When we've had um, on that Cal that uh, Colorado trip, we had a 400 mile day and we got poured on. We had a motel already set up because it was 400 miles. 
so glad we did because going across color from Denver to Grand Junction, it was cold and pouring rain and we got in after dark. So glad we had the motel. Yeah. A couple of the notes. A couple of the notes. Hey, we're, com we're, we're coming to the end and uh, I wanted to, uh, if you, if you are ready to finish up, I wanted to ask uh, uh, an interesting question here that Todd just asked uh, over in the chat is, uh, and he said, do you guys use a GPS for traffic and or weather at all? Uh, not GPS typ typically. I have a, a 660, uh, the Garmin. I just don't use it. I mean, I just find that the, what, what uh, Google Maps and uh, gives me is, is fine. I have a Ram, um, Ram um, X, what is it, X script uh, for my phone. And I, that, it works really fine by me. Now, I will say that if, uh, if it's a complex um, route that, uh, you know, that I feel I need to follow really strictly, I'll use the GPS for that. Uh, but again, for weather and everything else, the smartphone kind of does everything I need it to do. In the, in the, in the old days, we had a had paper maps, you know, roadside origami, and uh, stick all, <laughs> all of them in the uh, stick them all in the tank bag um, window, and that's how we we dealt with things then. Right. But it's way better now. A couple well, things before we go, I know we're almost there. Is that just make sure that you kind of think about things when you keeping clean can be tough. I know that's a, a, a concern Tony has. Uh, now, if campgrounds will have showers, you know, mostly they do. Uh, they're not great showers sometimes, but if you are in a pinch, have a washcloth and just get it wet and sort of wash yourself down that way. That's one way you can kind of get away with, you know, at least feeling not too grungy. Uh, also make sure that you have clotheslines and, and uh, clothespins. Again, these are just things that you may not think about, but they don't take any room. I put them in a little Ziploc bag and you're going to thank yourself later. Um, I guess that's all I've got. Oh, except a couple more things. When it comes to loading your bike, make sure you do it smart. Load it uh, so that it's not out of balance. We learned that with her. Uh, front to rear, side to side. Uh, rock straps are awesome. Like, you know, don't use bungee cords anymore. Get rock straps, are okay. Um, and then uh, there are dry bags that are out there like the Moscow bags uh, you know they're really nice stuff now though those get expensive but if you get good stuff you will use it for years and years and years so, literally I use the dry spec stuff which is great so that's all I've got well that was fantastic and you know this was a really interesting uh, session uh, Ken and Carolyn and thank you so much uh, I think everyone really enjoyed it Todd Bryant uh, said thank you and uh, and uh, it's a really uh, great, uh, great topic, and I think uh, a real personal one for a lot of people. And I'd like to remind everyone uh, that uh, we, we'd all like to keep this wonderful free content coming. So if you would consider it, head over to Ken's uh, website or his Patreon site and uh, make a donation, either a one-time donation or a, uh, uh, become a patron of uh, Ken's. Uh, at writing in the zone and you can find that page at writing in the zone.com and if you want to contact ken uh please feel free it's ken at writing in the zone.com and uh guys thank you so much boy did i enjoy this tonight what great questions and uh, you guys are just made to camp together <laughs> <laughs> I, like the I like the uh comments people have made in the chat yeah thank you for all your comments yeah appreciate it Awesome. Well, hey, thanks Thank a lot. We'll see you, you next everyone. Time. All right. Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye.